historical geologists. I hope you're having a good day. This video is called Summer 27, and um, the material in uh, Summer 26 and Summer 27 will be on the third test. I know it's hard to start thinking about the third test when you just took the second test, but we need to move forwards and start on chapter number eight. Chapter number eight is about Earth history. The history of the Earth. That's a huge topic to cover. And if you're really interested in Earth history, I teach a class about it. It's called Historical Geology, where we cover the history of planet Earth. But there's really no way to talk about the history of planet Earth without talking about it in the grander scheme of things. In other words, our planet, Earth, is the third planet from the sun in our solar system. So let's take a look at our solar system for a moment. Our solar system consists of eight planets, and let's see if I get a nice picture of it here for you. The eight planets that revolve around the sun. Our planet is the third planet from the sun. First planet from the sun is Mercury, then Venus, then Earth, then Mars, which we're going to be visiting it probably in about 15 years. <clears throat> Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. There's a, a Pluto is a, a little body out here that is no longer considered to be a planet because it's too small. So that's our solar system. Now our sun is just a, one star in the Milky Way galaxy. And I want to show you how tiny Earth is in the grand scheme of things. Just take a look at our galaxy, the Milky Way. The Milky Way galaxy looks like this. And we're just one star out of 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. That's how tiny we are. We are just one of these tiny little points of light out of the 200 billion stars in our galaxy. In the center of our galaxy, in the center of all galaxies, is a, what we call a black hole. The black hole has so much gravitational pull that it holds our galaxy together. We're going to be talking about gravity. Gravity is caused by matter, the mass of matter. The bigger, the more mass something has, the greater the gravitational pull. You are not, if you were on the moon, you could jump 20 feet and land over there, 20 feet from here, because the moon is a lot smaller than the Earth, and so it has less gravitational pull. The sun's gravity holds together our solar system. And the black hole in the center of galaxies holds galaxies together. Black holes are made of something called dark matter. So there's two kinds of matter in this universe. There's dark matter and there's light matter. Before we get into that more detail, I wanted to show, think about this. The Earth is one planet amongst eight revolving around the sun. Our, our sun is one star out of 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? There's more than two trillion known galaxies in our universe. See how small we are? We're less than a grain of sand on a beach. And to make things even more complicated for you all, we're probably not the only universe. 
there may be an infinite number of universes. But let's talk about our universe. And in order to understand how our universe formed, first I wanted to talk about a man named Edwin, Hub Edwin Hubble. You might have heard of the, Hub the Hubble telescope. Well, back in 1929, Edwin Hubble, an American scientist, was looking through telescopes into outer space. And he came up with a theory that is still the most widely accepted theory regarding how our universe came to be. And it's called the Big Bang Theory. And I believe in the Big Bang Theory, and so do almost all scientists, and I'll tell you why. And I want to explain to you Edwin Hubble's line of thought. When you look into outer space, and you see all those stars out in the night sky, you look through it at a telescope, through a telescope, we got to remember what a telescope really is. A telescope is a time machine. You might, you might say, what, what's he talking about? What, how can a telescope be a time machine? Well, it is. If you look at a star that is um, a thousand light years away, a star a thousand light years away, you are looking 1,000 years into the past. Why? Well, because of what Einstein figured out. E is equal to mc squared. We know the speed of light. We know how fast light travels. And therefore, we know that that star a thousand light years away, we're not seeing it the way it is now. We're, see we're looking at it the way it was 1,000 years ago. Okay? It's basic physics. So if I look at a, another star that is a hundred thousand light years away what that means is I'm looking one hundred thousand years into the past if I look at another star that's one billion light years away I'm looking one billion years into the past it took one billion years years for the light from that star to reach planet earth so Edwin Hubble figured out well if we can do that we can produce a motion picture of time going from a hundred years ago to far farther out in space to 10,000 years ago to a million years ago to a hundred million years ago to 500 million years ago and we can go all the way back to the beginning when everything began when time space and energy were created we can go back to the Genesis moment How do we know that the universe is 13.7 billion years old? That seems unimaginable. How can scientists figure that out? Easy. If you want to go back to the very beginning of time, find the farthest object in the night sky, and you are looking back to the very beginning. And the farthest out objects in the night sky are called quasars. This is what a quasar looks like and these objects are so far away from us that the light from those objects has taken 13.7 billion years to reach us. This is uh, stuff like this is you can spend a lifetime studying this and, and it's extremely interesting but uh, if we can, uh, if we go back in time by looking farther out in outer space, we can produce a motion picture of time. And what Hubble did was he figured out that um, the the other star systems are moving away from from our sun. Other think about it: if other star systems are moving away from our sun. That means in the past, that means the universe is expanding, right? If other stars are moving away from our sun, 
then the universe is expanding. Which means that in the past our universe was smaller. And then it was even smaller. And we can figure that out by looking through our telescopes that there's our, our universe is smaller and smaller until at 13.7 billion years ago all matter, energy, and space and time existed in a point so small I could fit it on my fingertip. And so what that means is that 13.7 year, billion years ago, true, I'm sorry, yeah, 13.7 billion years ago, there was an explosion, which we call the Big Bang, and everything was created. Time, space, energy, matter was created 13.7 billion years ago. Different people have, uh, we will never know what happened before the Big Bang. Why? Because time did not exist, and we are creatures that live within time. So it's hard for us to imagine how something could have existed before time to create everything from nothing. Um, it's not scientific, but as a Christian, I, it, th it sounds like the book of Revelation. To me. Um, it's a book of Genesis to me. In the beginning, there was nothingness, and then let there be light. I mean, how could everything have been created by nothing? Uh, maybe there was a creator, and I can't prove that. But let's learn a little bit more about this Big Bang here. This is a short 5 minute and 49 second video about the Big Bang. So let me see if I can get that on for you. Uh, okay, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. First remain. It's only a matter of time for some long sought okay. answers to emerge. Okay, put it to the beginning here. Here we go. The universe is everything. From the tiniest particles, to the largest galaxies, to the very existence of space, time, and life. But how did it all begin? The origin of the universe is the origin of everything. Multiple scientific theories plus creation myths from around the world have tried to explain its mysterious genesis. However, the most widely accepted explanation is the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory states that the universe began as a hot and infinitely dense point. Only a few millimeters wide, it was similar to a supercharged black hole. About 13.7 billion years ago, this tiny singularity violently exploded. And it is from this explosion, this bang, that all matter, energy, space, and time were created. What happened next were two major stages of the universe's evolution. Called the radiation and matter eras, they're defined by key events that helped shape the universe. First came the radiation era, named for the dominance of radiation right after the Big Bang. This era is made of smaller stages, called epochs, that occurred within the universe's first tens of thousands of years. The earliest is the Planck epoch. No matter existed in the universe at this time, only energy and the ancestor to the four forces of nature, the superforce. At the end of this stage, however, a key event occurred in which gravity split away from the superforce. Next came the Grand Unification Epoch, named for the three remaining unified forces of nature. This epoch ended when one of those forces, called strong or strong nuclear, broke away. Then the inflationary epoch began, during which the universe rapidly expanded. Almost instantly, it grew from the size of an atom to the size of a grapefruit. The universe at this time was piping hot and it churned with electrons, quarks, and other particles. Then came the electroweak epoch, when the last two forces, electromagnetic and weak, 
finally split off. During the next stage, the Quark Epic, all of the universe's ingredients were present. However, the universe was still too hot and dense for subatomic particles to form. Then, in the Hadron Epic, the universe cooled down enough for quarks to bind together and form protons and neutrons. In the lepton and nuclear epochs, the radiation era's last two stages, the protons and neutrons underwent a significant change. They fused and created nuclei. And in doing so, they created the first chemical element in the universe, helium. The universe's new ability to form elements, the building blocks of matter, cued the matter era. Much as the name suggests, the matter era is defined by the presence and predominance of matter in the universe. It features three epochs that span billions of years, the vast majority of the universe's lifespan, and includes the present day. The first was the atomic epoch. In this stage, the universe's temperature cooled down enough for electrons to attach to nuclei for the first time. Called recombination, this process helped create the universe's second element, hydrogen. This hydrogen, along with helium atoms, dotted the universe with atomic clouds. Within the clouds, small pockets of gas may have had enough gravity to cause atoms to collect. These clusters of atoms, formed during the galactic epoch, became the seedlings of galaxies. Nestled inside those galaxies, stars began to form. And in doing so, they cued the latest and current stage of the universe's development, the stellar epoch. The formation of stars then caused a tremendous ripple effect and helped shape the universe as we know it. Heat within the stars caused the conversion of helium and hydrogen into almost all the remaining elements in the universe. In turn, those elements became the building blocks for planets, moons, life, everything we see today. This ecosystem of everything was only possible because of the many stages in the universe's development. While countless questions about the origins of our universe remain, it's only a matter of time for some long sought answers to emerge. Okay, I'm, I, that's a lot to absorb. Uh, uh, if you've never seen any, any of this stuff before. But there's a lot to absorb if you've never seen this stuff, if you've heard about this stuff before. Um, but I'm going to try and explain it the best I can. Um, that film showed you that there was a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. And that's when everything we know of was created. Time, space, energy, uh, matter, and life. First thing that was formed was time. Time began 13.7 billion years ago. Then energy then um i'm sorry time and space were created then energy and last matter and then the very last life and the basic uh, there's basically there's four physical forces in the universe that control everything that we can see galaxies stars planets and those are called the four fundamental forces that they referred to in the video. The four fundamental forces in the universe are gravity, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force. Let me explain what these four forces are. The first one is gravity. Gravity is based on Sir Isaac Newton's formula. The force of gravity is equal to the mass of one object times the mass of another object which we'll call mass 2 times a constant which is called uh, capital G which is a gravitational constant divided by R squared and R is the distance between two objects squared but basically what gravity means is 
that the bigger and heavier something is, the more it's going to attract you. So that's why the planets revolve around the sun, because of the immense gravitational pull of the sun. And the stars revolve around the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy due to the immense gravitational pull of that black hole in the center of our galaxy. So gravity holds planets uh, around uh, star systems, or, or like our sun. It allows for the moon to revolve around the Earth due to the pull, gravitational pull of the, of the Earth. And it holds galaxies together. The second force we'll talk about is strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is the strongest force in the universe. Stronger than anything. The strong nuclear force is the force that holds atoms together. Now you already know, learned about atoms before. They're made of protons, neutrons, electrons, and many other little things. But to give you an idea how small an atom is, uh, uh, look at your thumb. And look at one little dot on your thumb. There are more than a trillion atoms on that little dot on your thumb. That's how small an atom is. No human will ever see a, an atom. They're just too small. But we know they're there because of the way matter behaves. If I were to take one atom out of my thumb and I were to split it, I would release enough strong nuclear e uh, force energy to destroy everything from here to Oliver Springs. Uh, and I'm in Oak Ridge right now. So you, you can imagine how strong the strong nuclear force is. It's just, it's unimaginably strong. Third uh, um, force in the universe is the weak nuclear force. We already studied that a little bit. That's radioactive decay, alpha decay, beta decay, and some other times. Where uh, unstable isotopes change into daughters and release energy, which is called radiation. That's the third force. The fourth energy, type of energy is called the electromagnetic force. And that's energy released by stars, including our sun, uh, which releases light that you, you light so we can see each other. Uh, it releases um, ultraviolet waves, uh, gamma rays, radio waves, AM, FM, and shortwave radio waves, television waves, microwaves. Those all come from all, all of those different forms of energy are released by stars and go through outer space. All matter that you and I can see in the universe is called light matter. And it obeys the laws of physics. That includes the stars, the planets, the sun, um, everything that we can see. Quasars. But there is a strange form of matter called dark matter and I'm embarrassed to say but we scientists know that dark matter is 90% of the universe and we know it's there because of its, gra because of its gravitational pull it, it, it's so dense that it pulls things towards it but we know nothing about it, it and it does not obey the laws of physics which really goes to show you how little we scientists know, but we can't help but um, try and figure out as much as we can. So going back uh, to the Big Bang, uh, it began. Uh, you should remember the Earth began. I mean, the universe began 13.7 billion years ago. You should know about the four types of force in the universe. You should know the order in which things appeared after the Big Bang. First, we formed uh, time, space, and, and then we formed energy, and then we formed subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and then we form atoms. And all of the elements in the periodic table were, the first ones were formed were hydrogen and helium. But all of the other elements on the, in the periodic table, so let's take a, take a look at our periodic table here for a moment.
Okay, here's our trusty periodic table that you might remember from high school. And we studied elements a little bit. We know about the atomic mass and the atomic number. Well, these hydrogen and helium, the first two elements, were formed first. But all of these other elements that we see here were formed in stars. Stars are like fa factories. They make these heavier elements. And we'll, we could talk more about that in historical geology, but the elements were formed. How do we know this Big Bang actually occurred? We know because the uh, we the, the radiation that was produced by the Big Bang can actually be measured. And we also know because we know the speed of light. Stars die, he talks here about the death of a star, to a, uh, what we call a supernova. And when um, they collapse, all stars will die. Our sun will die sometime through a supernova. So, now we're gonna, getting a little bit closer to understanding how our planet formed. And in order to under, really understand how our planet formed, we need to... Uh, so we know the Big Bang Theory is the, our best guess as to how the universe began. What's our best guess as to how um, our solar system formed? So the Big Bang Theory is the theory for our universe and for our solar system. Um, the theory that we use is the solar nebular theory. The solar nebular theory. Okay, what's that about? Well, I'm going to try and get a, a picture here to show you. Here's a picture from the Internet. What happened was, five billion years ago, there was another star that existed before our sun, and it went supernova. It exploded, and it formed a huge cloud of energy and matter, depicted right here. Two forces, according to physics, must have acted upon this cloud of energy and matter. And those are the gravity force and the centrifugal force. The centrifugal force and the gravity force. Let's talk about that. Okay. Now, you already know that... Um, matter attracts matter, right? And the more ma matter that there is, the more mass, the more the attraction. Knowing that, do you think that this cloud of debris would be attracted to the nothingness of outer space and expand, or would it contract? Well, gravity would cause the matter to contract, wouldn't it? Because matter is going to be attracted to matter. So the first thing that must have happened to this cloud of, of matter is it started to contract. It started to condense. Then the centrifugal force must have acted upon this cloud. And what's the centrifugal force? Well, the centrifugal force is basically, uh, can be imagined like this. Uh, think about the Winter Olympics. Uh, and you understand the centrifugal force. Uh, imagine a skater on the ice. Uh, she's she's skating on the ice, and she brings her arms in closer together. Is she going to start to spin faster or slower? She's going to start to spin faster, right? And this cloud of debris condensing or sh or coming together, it's just like the skater bringing her arms together. That's going to start to cause this cloud to spin faster, and it would form a disk like this. This disk would cool. Gravity would pull 99.9% .9 of the matter into the center to form the sun, and then the planets would revolve around the sun, 
held by the sun's gravity, held in orbit by the sun's gravity. The moons would revolve around various planets held together by each planet's gravity. We only have one moon, but Jupiter has dozens. So, how do we know that this is the way our solar system formed 4.6 billion years ago? We know because we can look through our telescopes and see that other stars, just like our sun, were formed in the same way, from the supernova of a pre-existing star. And we know the laws of physics, which always, always work for all light matter. So this is our best explanation for how our solar system formed 4.6 billion years ago. Let's talk about each planet. Uh, back in the old days, um, in your grandparents' day, or your great-grandparents' day, in the 1960s, and we started to explore space. And it all started in uh, due to the Soviet Union during the Cold War, they um, sent a satellite into space called Sputnik in the 50, late 50s. Our president at the time, President Eisenhower, uh, didn't want the communist world to get to the moon first, so the space program was set up, and it was continued under President Kennedy. And we landed men on the moon, and it was a big thing. Imagine your grandparents uh, watching those old black and white TVs. They were in amazement when they saw men landing on the moon. Well, that was just the beginning. Since that time, we have used unmanned spacecraft to visit all of the planets in the solar system. And we're exploring for the possibility of colonization of some of these places. And we're also looking for life. In 1972, we um, explored the first planet, Mercury. The first planet from the sun is Mercury with a Mariner mission. Mercury, we quickly learned, was not a possible place for life. Why? Because Mercury is too small. Look, Mercury being so small, it has almost no gravity force. And what allows for us to have an atmosphere and all of those life-giving gases, oxygen, is Earth's gravity, gravitational pull. Mercury is too small to have an atmosphere, so there is no atmosphere. And that means that if you were, if you were on Mercury, uh, asteroids and comets and uh, debris from outer space are constantly striking the planet, not allowing for any organic matter to become life. The second reason why we know Mercury could not uh, uh, support life is it's just too close to the sun. It's so hot on Mercury that lead would boil. The second planet from the sun, Venus, we had a lot of hope for with regards to life. In the late 1800s, people used to call it our sister planet. And we could, we could see clouds and rivers, and we ima imagined uh, worlds uh, uh, there on Venus, um, and life on Venus. But when our spacecraft visited Venus, we were disappointed. Life cannot exist on Venus as we know it. Why? Well, sure, there is. Venus is big enough to have an atmosphere, but those clouds are not water clouds. We found out they're sulfuric acid clouds. And the, the surface, the, the rivers are made of acids, which would destroy organic life. Second thing is we found out that Venus has an atmosphere of 95% carbon dioxide. 
In comparison, the Earth has 0.032% carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. The more carbon dioxide you have, the hotter the planet gets. Almost all scientists are worried about global warming. And I do believe global warming is occurring with, with temperature records. And so if we're worried about global warming with 0.032% CO2 and Venus has 95% CO2, plus the fact that Venus is closer to the sun, what do you think temperatures are going to be like on the Venetian surface? It's like an oven on broil. Organic matter as we know it, cells, cannot survive under those temperatures. They would burn up. Third planet from the sun, Earth. We're just right, like the Goldilocks story. We're, we're not too far from the sun, we're not too close to the sun. So we can have water in liquid, solid, and gaseous phase, phases, like in clouds. We're just the right size. If we were bigger, the gravity would be so strong that life would be destroyed. If we were smaller, we'd have no atmosphere and none of those life-giving gases. So people, it's like the old Goldilocks story your parents told you. About. Fourth planet from the sun is Mars. We plan to visit that in 15, 20 years. Uh, it's hard to imagine any things that Democrats and Republicans agree on, but uh, thank God they, everybody agrees that we will go to Mars, and we should be there in 15, 20 years, and you'll have a moment just like your grandparents when the first astronauts visit Mars. Uh, I'm a geologist. I don't think like most people. Uh, 50 years is nothing to me. 200 years ago, uh, George Washington, 250 years ago, that's not a long time ago to me. A million years is not a long time ago. For me. But I can see a, a point in time where humans will leave Earth. It's going to happen. And we will colonize the moon and Mars. And that's just the beginning. You know, it's... A lot of people find it hard to believe, but Mars is has all the ingredients for life. There's water on Mars, and water is H2O, so we can um, change water into oxygen, and we can manufacture an oxygen-rich atmosphere. So if we enclosed it with a bubble-like structure, we could start to farm. We could start to uh, build communities there. Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury, those four planets taken together are called the terrestrial planets. So the terrestrial planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the terrestrial planets. The outer four planets are called the Jovian planets. Mars may have life on it. It may have had life in the, in the past, too, um, because it has water. It has an atmosphere. Once our, uh, we leave Mars and go towards the outer four planets, the Jovian planets, we have to get past the asteroid belt. Thousands, about 3,000 some uh, asteroids uh, are between Mars and Jupiter. So any spacecraft that visits these outer planets the Jovian planets, has to negotiate a path between the asteroid belt. Then we get to Jupiter. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. We, vis we started visiting, visiting it in the 1970s uh, um, under the Nixon administration. And... Um, we quickly learn life is not possible on Jupiter. It's too far from the sun. It's cold. So it has a poisonous uh, liquid hydrogen and helium atmosphere. Poisonous gases. Plus, it is so big that the gravitational force is so strong it would destroy life. If a Shaquille O'Neal, 7 foot 6, 300 pound guy, 
were to land on Jupiter, he would be crushed to the size of a thimble. That's how strong gravity is on Jupiter. Jupiter may not be a good candidate for life, but one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, is probably the best place to look for life in the solar system at, that we can think of at the moment. This is the moon, one of uh, many moons that are, revolve around um, Jupiter. Here's Europa. And it, it, notice something. See these tracks here? W what is this stuff on the top? That's ice. And beneath that, just uh, um, sometimes only maybe 50, 100 feet beneath it, is an ocean. So this is, uh, 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 Europa has the second ocean in our solar system. So NASA and other space agencies are planning to travel to Europa to explore for signs of life. Spacecraft would have to land on Europa. We'd have to melt through the ice and send a submarine into the ocean with headlights and video so we could take video to see. A reporter asked a NASA spokesman about the possibility of life in the European Ocean. And I, was, I really liked his answer. He said, it took 400 million years for life to appear in Earth's oceans. And the European Ocean is 4.6 billion years old. You tell me, will there be anything intelligent living in it? There's been enough time for life and even intelligent life so it's going to, going to be interesting next planet is saturn the second largest planet in the solar system and the rings are ice crystals it's even farther from the sun so we know that life probably could not exist there it's just too cold poison again it has a poison hydrogen helium atmosphere and it's even colder and it's too big, the gravitational force would crush life on that planet. Uranus is just so far from the sun that we don't think life could be there. Not only is so cold there, not only do you have frozen hydrogen and helium, you have frozen methane on that planet. So we're talking about temperatures minus 300, minus 400 Celsius. I mean, just impossible. It's just so cold. And Neptune's even colder. And so not only do you have frozen methane, you have frozen ammonia. So you're getting to the uh, to the lowest possible temperatures according to chemistry. The lowest possible temperature would be minus 473 degrees Celsius. You're getting the, close to the very coldest. And so we don't think life could exist there. Don't forget which planets are Jovian and which ones are um, terrestrial. And uh, we'll continue on in the next video.